Let's take a little closer look at the electrolysis process that's used for cleaning iron relics. I think I've casually mentioned it in a few of my videos, but I've never really showed you my setup or how I do it. Uh, and it's an important part of relic hunting. If you, if you dig iron relics, you have to do something to preserve them or they'll just flake and flake and, and eventually turn into a pile of dust. Uh, so let's go over here and take a look at my tank and I'll show you uh, how I do it. This is one of my electrolysis tanks and I use several. Uh, when I have a lot of stuff, I'll have several of them going at one time. Normally the water isn't this clean, but I just dump the old dirty water so you could actually see down in there before we get it started uh, and see what happens when uh, the electricity is put to it. But let's take a look at what's going on here. I use a 12 volt manual battery charger. This charger is uh, made for charging car batteries and lawn tractor batteries and that sort of thing. But the important part about it is that it's manual. If you try to use an automatic battery charger, it will just keep shutting down. There's no use to even try using one. So go to eBay or go to a flea market and find yourself some manual battery chargers. You can probably pick one up for 15 bucks at a flea market or something. So our positive terminal from our battery charger, the red one, is attached to this wire which is attached to this piece of rebar. I have one on each side of the tank. And the relics to be cleaned are in between, and you notice they're not touching. The negative side from the charger is attached to the iron relics. It's very important that the relics are attached to the negative side of the charger, not the positive side. If you attach the positive side to the relics, you're going to destroy them or seriously damage them. It's important that you have some sort of electrolyte in the water to carry the current through. And in this case, I'm just using baking soda, just regular old baking soda. I think I have maybe about a half a cup in there, and that should do just fine. And we're going to find out if it's going to work in just a second. In order to get good electrical contact, I've drilled small holes in each of these pieces and put a screw in it. And the idea is that the outside surface of the relics are so encrusted that you'd never be able to make very good electrical contact. So uh, you may cringe at the fact that there are holes drilled in these things, but once it's all finished, I can fill them in with black epoxy, and you'll never know that there was ever a hole there. This lock plate actually had a hole there already, so I didn't have to drill it. So let's fire this thing up and see if it works. I'm going to start out at 2 amps, 12 volt, 2 amps, so it's a second click. And you can see the needle has jumped to 2 amps, so it should be working. And indeed it is. If you look closely, you'll see bubbles coming off of the relics. So we'll let this stuff cook overnight, and by morning it should be good to go. We'll take it out and get it ready for hot wax. Well, our relics have been in electrolysis for about 24 hours, so let's go down to the basement, pull them out of the tank, and see how they look. Well, here's our electrolysis tank, and as you can see, the water has gotten pretty dirty, and there's lots of bubbles and foam, and that means that it's doing what it's supposed to do. So, let's go over here. First things first, turn off the power, All right? Let's disconnect the leads, just to be on the safe side. And let's pull these things out of here and see what they look like. As you can see, most of the rust has just fallen off of this stuff. But there's almost always some amount of hand work that you have to do um, on, this, on this shell fragment. You can see there's still a little bit of rust at the bottom and if you pick at it a little bit with your fingers or a, maybe a, a small screwdriver or something if you you know sort of gently pick at them uh, you don't want to chisel at them and, and put uh, you don't want to mar the surface but you can usually pick this stuff off and it'll it'll uh, it'll release fairly easily and you do have to be careful with thinner objects like this uh, face plate from a lock as you can see uh, we got a hole in the surface of it, and there's not much you can do about it. It's just so thin uh, that there wasn't a whole lot of iron left there. 
but it's still in one piece, uh, and I think it's going to be okay. We'll get the rest of this rust off, and it'll it'll look nice. Same with our gun tool. There's not a whole lot of metal there to work with, and, and there's not a whole lot of metal to begin with, so you do have to be careful. Um, you know, there was really no way to get this thing clean other than put it in electrolysis. If you would have tapped at it with a hammer or something, it would have probably broken because it's so, you know, it's not very robust. So I'll pick at all this stuff by hand with screwdrivers and toothpicks and uh, maybe a little bit of, of brass wire brush and that sort of thing. And I'll get all that remaining scale off of them and then we'll drop them into the hot wax bath. This is one more step that I forgot to mention that I always do with my iron relics before I run them through hot wax treatment. That freshwater soak will help to leach the baking soda from the electrolysis process back out of the surface of the iron. If you skip that step, it won't hurt anything, but you'll start to see a white haze form on the surface of the iron over a period of a week or two, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But it, it's very unattractive. It looks like mold growing almost. And, you can take a like a stiff bristle brush and brush it and it comes off but after another week or so it'll start to come back and it just keeps doing it, it just keeps coming back and keeps coming back and uh, it becomes a real pain in the behind so just just soak it in water fresh water for about a day or so and then do your your uh, surface treatment and make sure it's non chlorinated water because chlorine is very very bad for iron and it will promote further uh, corrosion so that's it We've removed all the rust and scale from these iron relics, but we're not finished. The next step is to remove the moisture from the iron. These things have been in the ground or in a riverbed for 150 years or more, so they've accumulated a lot of moisture in the iron. Iron's very porous, especially cast iron. In order to get that moisture out of the iron, we either have to heat it above the boiling point of water, or we have to put it in some sort of vacuum chamber. I don't have a fancy vacuum chamber, but I can heat it. I use the hot wax technique because it kills two birds with one stone. Because it's heated to a temperature above the boiling point of water, it will literally boil all the water out of the iron. And in that process, it simultaneously coats the surface, which then, of course, hardens and acts as a vapor barrier. Now, this relic wasn't part of my original video. Uh, this was found two summers ago. It's already been uh, run through electrolysis and hot waxed and, and it's preserved. It looks like it's holding up pretty well. But I brought it in here just to show you uh, what a complete shell looks like from, from a base like this. This is a reed shell base. This is a copper sabot or sabo. And that's, desi and that's designed to expand into the rifling grooves of the gun to create spin on the shell so it flies straight. But this is a complete reed shell. So this is what they look like. As you can see, it's the same type of system. Pretty cool, huh? I thought you might want to see a comparison of what iron relics look like when they first come out of the ground. Now this is a 12-pound cannonball fragment, an explosive cannonball fragment. It obviously blew up. But look at the difference. This is what the shells, this is what all of these things look like when you first dig them out of the ground. They're rusty and crusty. Uh, this stuff is scaly. It, it, uh, you can see it's flaking off. And this process will continue. It'll, it'll flake down to bare iron, and then it'll start to rust again. And it may take a year or so. It'll start to blister, and then it'll start to flake again. And this process will repeat itself and repeat itself until there's nothing left of the iron. Um, that's why we do what we do with electrolysis and waxing and tannic acid and that sort of thing. But I thought that was interesting. Let's get a close up. Big difference, huh? The same type of material, they're both cast iron. One's treated, one's not. If any of you guys have an idea on what this might be, I would love to hear your comments on it. I'm pretty sure it was a horseshoe, and it was cut and straightened out and sharpened on the end, uh, I, I guess to make some sort of chisel or something. But if you have any ideas, please uh, post them in the comments. I'd love to see what you think about it. Thanks.